the land of lakes, this is 10,000 Takes. Brought to you by Minnesota Score Radio. Wally and Eric back for yet another week as we slice and dice the always busy, always topical, super saturated Twin Cities sports scene. And Wally, it's another episode of 10K Takes Television. As usual, we have plenty of topics to get into. I think we have to start with the Minnesota Twins who finished up their homestand on a bizarre and controversial note Sunday over at Trendy Target Field. And wow, they're off to the West Coast. Dodgers, Angels, but probably a bitter taste in the mouth of most yeah. of those twins after uh, they had a, a run given back to Toronto on a review in yeah. the 10th inning. Yeah, that's an unfortunate way for them to lose the baseball game, although they had their chance to tie it in the bottom of the 10th, so let's not get too far into Yeah, all blaming. that did was keep the game giving Toronto a one-run lead, even if they took the right. run off the board, it still was tied. Right, and, and if you talk to managers and players, they'll tell you it's mandatory to score one run. So you've yep. got to score yep. two. If you're going to win the baseball game the way things are, you got to score two with that guy automatically on second base. That's how you win the baseball game. You know, and unless you have, unless you're the road team with a, you know, a lockdown closer, you know, you get that one run, and then in the bottom of the inning, the home team isn't going to get a hit off of Emmanuel Classe, for example. <laughs> I knew just, he'd go I'm there. just saying. <laughs> he, he pitches for Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and very well, I might add. That's probably the reason they're right there on the on the heels of the Twins. <laughs> well, and they are. They're yeah. one game behind the Twins, and the White Sox are two games back. So uh, it's basically where it was when they started yep. this series. They split with the uh, Blue Jays. Cleveland split with Houston. Uh, I think that's a feather in Cleveland's cap. Houston, Houston's looked awfully good, and the Yankees are stumbling a little bit. They've only won six of their last 17 games coming into this week. So yeah. maybe they are coming back to earth a little. Maybe they were overachievers in the first half of the season. It's possible. Houston might be the best team in the American League. I agree. Time, time will you know solve all of that. Right now, the best team record-wise is the next opponent for the Minnesota Twins, the L.A. Dodgers, who own the San Diego Padres, <laughs> even with Juan Soto and Manny Machado and you know all the stars the Padres right. have assembled. So the Twins have to play two with the Dodgers at Dodger Stadium. That won't be easy. And then they go play the Angels down the I-5 freeway. But you know, back to that game... Sunday, I was there. It, it, you had two sack flies in the 10th inning, both reviewed. So Whit Merrifield was the ghost runner, the former Royal, now a Blue Jay. Right. He's at second for the Jays, and you have a fly ball to Byron Buxton. He makes the catch, and he, he had a bazooka throw to third and almost got Merrifield. Rocco appealed that. They looked at it said, no, the call stands. He's safe. So Rocco loses the challenge. Then the next batter hits one to medium left field. Oh, I don't even know if it's medium. It looked <laughs> short to me. It, it was well, Tim Beckham throw to the plate, right? He's ruled out. Merrifield called out. Here comes the uh, Toronto skipper, John Schneider, to appeal that one with a review. And they look at it. It was about a five-minute delay. I bet. New York City was, you know, pondering this one because there was so much at stake. Right. And they overturned it. And here comes Rocco out of the dugout. Rocco went ballistic. He's not a robot. At least he wasn't yesterday. And Rocco will get a fine, maybe a suspension. I don't think uh, he's going to be doing lunch with Marty Foster, the plate umpire, anytime <laughs> soon. Or the review people in New York City who overturned it. Well, back in the day, Gardy would take, like, the bats and throw them out onto the field and, and gloves and baseballs, whatever he can find in the dugout. Did Rocco take his laptop and throw that out <laughs> onto the field? <laughs> no, that's too precious. Oh, okay. I don't know if the Twins would uh, comp him another one. But what he did do, you know, by today's standards, you know, they've, they've basically sanitized the game. You don't have those Earl Weaver, Billy Martin, right. Ron Garden higher moments where things get heated <laughs> and the fans love it. It's like worldwide wrestling. Rocco came out, though, and immediately tossed the cap. And then he got in the, uh, in the eyeballs of Marty Foster, the plate ump, and he also got into it with uh, another one of the umpires, Alan Porter, the crew chief, and they were going at it, and he made his case, and then he kicked some dirt on the plate, and he walked off the field, he motioned up top, he was hot, and his comments afterward, Rocco doesn't care about getting a fine because what he said, he basically said it was one of the worst calls in recent history in the whole game. Okay, so here's the, here's the rub on that, though. The home plate umpire had the call that he wanted. 
Right? So this goes back to New York. So what he needed to do was to either get on the phone or fly to New York and kick dirt on whoever overtook that, him. That's a good point. I right? brought up Marty Foster, the plate up. He actually called him out with Marifel. Exactly. The, the crew chiefs, if you want to place blame, replay crew chiefs, Mark Carlson, Paul Emmel. So those are the guys that Rocco will definitely not be having lunch with. Yeah, you're right. But then you go by the letter of the law, going back to when Buster Posey of the San Francisco Giants. The wind collision. pool. Yeah, they broke his leg, home plate, catcher. And, and now what you have is baseball basically saying you, you can't have collisions at the plate. So did Gary Ch Sanchez block the plate? That's what the, uh, that's what the replay crew said, that Merrifield didn't have a chance to score. Okay, so... Where was Sanchez supposed to be able to I, catch that baseball? I, I don't like the rule personally. I, I, I think it's where bull. I think. <laughs> I, I mean, it reminds me of some of these roughing the uh, quarterback calls we see in the NFL. Yeah. What, to, what was he supposed to? Was he supposed to, uh, you know, be into the middle of the infield and reach out like yeah, this to try and catch the darn ball? I mean, it's a ridiculous rule. It really yeah, is. I'm it sorry. was, uh, it, it, and unless. You know, unless he is standing there without the baseball and without right. a chance to catch the baseball, I think that that's, that's just bull. It really is. It's a terrible rule. Baseball has changed a lot of things over the years, but that's one that I can't say. Now, that happened in the Sealy era. I'm not going to blame that one on Well, they, on, just, on they just don't want any contact. They I know. don't want another Posey situation, but they've overreacted is what they've done. And, and yesterday... It's like Little League. It really... Uh, was a was a blow to the Minnesota Twins. Now, who knows if they would have won the game? We don't know that. But for Toronto, that was a huge win. They get out of the Twin Cities, you know, splitting a four-game series. I can tell you this. Gary Sanchez is a veteran. I can tell you right now, he was brought up and taught from day one that – you catch the ball and you get that leg down in order to not allow the runner's foot to get in. You're taught that basically at every base. If you're a third baseman and a guy's sliding, you're taught to drop your leg down to catch the ball and, and so you don't allow that, that leg to slide into the base. I, I, I hate it. I, I think that they have taken so much away from the game of baseball in the way that they do things now, and that's one of them. I just don't understand. Hey, look, the, the runner had every opportunity to slide around him. How about that for a call? Right. Well, it looked to me like Whit Merrifield, the minute he was called out, motioned to Marty Foster, "Hey, he blocked me. He didn't give me access to home plate." Mm -hmm. And that, I, and I knew the Blue Jays would would challenge. That why not? They have nothing oh, to lose in, in the tenth inning. Yeah. Um, I went to a couple games uh, at Target Field. It was a lot of fun because of the Blue Jays right. fans. It's very similar to when the Milwaukee Brewers play the Twins. You get this border battle, and they come in, and it's literally a coup d'état. There was so much blue in the stands, especially behind the Toronto dugout down the first baseline, and walking around downtown Minneapolis. Boy, I saw flocks of Blue Jay fans. And my lasting memory was leaving Sunday to get on I-94 West. Ahead of me was a tour bus from Saskatchewan. Of course there was. Probably taking a 15-hour trip back to the prairie of Canada <laughs> just so these Blue Jay fans could watch their beloved team. And a lot of Molson Blue. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, and Labatt's yeah, on that exactly. bus, I'm sure. The, the Maple Leaf flag was flying. Oh, brother. That's the other thing when Toronto's in town. You have two national anthems. So you're standing oh, for about, about four that. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but that's rough on you. I, well, <laughs> it's a good way to stretch. Yeah. It's okay. another seventh inning stretch. Okay. It's time before the game starts. All right. Well, we're going to talk some uh, gopher football coming up with, well, the uh, the eminent guy who knows all about gopher football. Yeah, Daryl Thompson. Uh, nobody ran the rock better than no. Daryl when he played for the gophers. We'll talk to him coming up. 10K takes your Blue Jays ticket. I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're perfect. <laughs> Maya? Why didn't you try these? It isn't just about vision. It's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. Ten thousand takes, Wally and Eric. Time to talk a little football. Gopher football in this case, Eric. Of course, uh, University of Minnesota, they've started practicing. The games start in early September. And joining us now is Daryl Thompson, the 
Former Gopher great, all-time leading rusher in Gopher history, now Gopher broadcaster on the radio since 1997. Uh, Daryl, it's going to be interesting. They open up September 1st at home against Jerry Kill, former Gopher coach who is now down in New Mexico. Uh, your thoughts on what that is going to look like? Well, I don't think there's any love loss between uh, Coach Fleck and, and Coach Kill and uh, probably the staffs and even like the community a little bit. I think there was so much positive energy that uh, Coach Fleck had going here, and it kind of it just kind of went sideways. So it's going to be, uh, I think it'll be very, very personal on um, you know Thursday night and about you know I guess three and a half weeks. So it's going to be a uh, it's going to be an entertaining and fun game. And games are always fun when they mean something to someone, and they mean a lot to um, both parties in this one. Daryl, what's the Vegas over-under on the post-game handshake between Jerry and PJ? I'm putting it at one second. I think it's going to be very brief with very little eye contact. I don't think there's going to, I don't think there's going to be a warm embrace like, you know, like you're my mentor or anything like that. I think it's going to be pretty, uh, a pretty cold handshake, even though it would be a pretty hot night. Well, I know that... If there is a handshake, I can see that there might not be a handshake, actually. Wow, entirely possible. Um, I know that what fueled this, for those who may or may not be familiar with it, was some of the things that PJ Fleck said about the culture that existed before, um, you know, before he got there. And Jerry Kill took exception to that. Am I right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't happy with um, the way that uh, Coach Fleck talked about the culture and the young men that were on the team, or you know, the um, you know everything that went on after he left. So it'll be. Uh, I just and I think they've had some phone conversations that haven't been real uh, cordial as well. So I, I don't think it's going to be. I, I don't think they'd rather just not be around. I don't think they're going to be chit chatting before the game like the small talk that head coaches have a lot of times, just kind of talking about life and the season and their kids, their families and wives. I don't think any of that stuff's going to go on. I think they're going to be in their respective areas, and that's where they're going to be. Contentious, probably the best way to describe it. I'm guessing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and Daryl, coaching acrimony aside, this is a huge game for Mo Ibrahim, who played running back like you did for the U of M. And before that injury in the opener against Ohio State last season, was targeted to be a high NFL pick, bright future. Uh, how does Mo look on the comeback trail? Well, I guess, you know, I wasn't at practice on Saturday, you know, but he looks good. You know, he looks good. He feels good. You know, practices is better and safer now and i think so is therapy and treatment so i, I think he's back 100 percent. i would expect to i actually expect him to um to break the record i have the record for uh, most yards i think there's a a really really good chance that he'll break it before probably two-thirds of the season's over so i i think he's going to have a great season uh another guy that's coming back Tanner Morgan. It seems like he's in about his ninth year now as quarterback, but he did decide to take advantage of, um, you know, because of the COVID situation. They allow the extra year. He's taken advantage of that. Uh, what does he bring to the table here, and how important is it, maybe even for him personally, to be back and accomplish what he needs to get done? Well, I think uh, maybe more importantly, what's back for him is Coach Schrock has come back. You know, he's been there for a while, a couple linemen have been back. Um, Chris Altman Bell comes back. Muhammad Abraham comes back. So there's a lot of experience. You know, there's some like veterans, you know, that are on the team, guys that are playing college fo football two years or some even maybe three years longer than you would normally play if you're a, uh, you know, a college football player. So there's some guys that have been around, been through camp, been through all the, all the experiences, won't get shaken as much in the game. So I, I expect, um, Big things out of uh, Tanner this year, especially if that offensive line can protect him a little bit. And with Coach Chirac coming back as his offensive coordinator and as, um, just as a guru, I think he he makes him feel good. And I think he also adds a level of comfort that Coach Fleck feels really, really good about. I think he trusts Coach Chirac basically implicitly. And I don't think he felt like that with his uh, with uh, Sanford, uh, especially not for the first year. Daryl, it's been about a month since there was a college football earthquake in Los Angeles. <laughs> USC and UCLA are coming to the Big Ten in two years. Have you been able to process that, what it means to the Gophers, assumption being these would be schools in the Big Ten West? I, I mean, it's still unbelievable to me. Well, you know, I think it's cool, you know, quite honestly. I, I just think it's 
it's it's where we're going in college uh, sports. That we're gonna everyone's gonna play everyone. We already kind of did. You have a non-conference. We're gonna play Oregon. We're gonna play Oregon State. We're gonna play some other. We played USC a couple years ago. Coach Kill's team did actually. We, it was a good game. It was fun. We almost beat them uh, in their place. So it was it was fun, you know, to play them. And we played them back here. So having them being part of the Big Ten, having them play us occasionally. I don't know how it's gonna work out. You know, with the time zones and the West and the East and everything else. It can be a challenge, you know, playing Maryland if you're UCLA or um, uh, or Rutgers and similar going the other direction for, um, you know, Rutgers or uh, Maryland going to UCLA and uh, everywhere else to, to play a game at, you know, most likely a night game and then get back basically, you know, Sunday morning at seven, eight, nine o'clock. It can be, um, it can take a little bit of a toll on you, but with, with the rest and the buys and everything else, I think there's a way to make it all work and uh, I'm excited about it. All right, with those two teams coming in, and who knows what other changes may ha- may occur before USC and UCLA come in, um, the Big Ten West, is it still gettable for the Gophers before that happens? Because that may change completely. We don't know how they're going to realign. We don't know. Maybe it'll be one big conference. Maybe it'll be three conferences uh, or three divisions within the conference. We don't know. But is this their best chance to win the Big Ten West and finally get to that uh, Big Ten championship game? I think the next two years are, you know, I think you make a good point, Wally. I, I think it certainly is. The next two years are a good chance to get it. And I don't. I think it still is even when they come in. I just think college football is different across the entire landscape. You know, when you look at what's going on at the directional schools, even what Coach Fleck did when he was at Western Michigan, people, facilities, um, the practice schedule, the social media, the – College football landscape has changed, but uh, certainly the next two years, at least you know, like you know what you got to do, and right now you know what you got to do, and really right now, so what we got to do is we got to beat Iowa, we got to beat Wisconsin, you know, we got to beat other people as well, but those are the two big dogs we got to beat. Should have beat both of them last year, only beat one of them, and you know, so it's it's certainly within grasp. Yeah, and you have to beat the Hawkeyes and the Badgers in the same season. You have to avoid a Bowling Green hiccup, which could be New Mexico State. Uh, the other thing, Daryl, Notre Dame. Do you think Notre Dame winds up in the Big Ten? And, and boy, that would bring a lot of cachet to the conference. You know what? I don't know. I mean, they're trying to. I mean, they've they've had their own situation for so long that's so advantageous to that school for them to join the Big Ten. Probably makes the most sense, you know, with their um, you know being close to Purdue, being close to Indiana. Um, you know, being right here in the Midwest, um, you know, and still be able to play Penn State, some of their traditional rivals makes a lot of sense. But money always talks. So it's always kind of comes down to the um, the money at the end of it. So we'll just have to kind of wait and see on that one. Number one strength, number one weakness of this 2022 version of Gopher football. Uh, I think the number one strength would be the running game. Uh, I think with Muhammad Abraham coming back and also uh, Trace and Potts, uh, those two as a healthy one-two combination, they could have a thousand yards apiece. You know, if the offensive line does what they, uh, what we feel that they can do, and I also feel like defensively, the strength is, a, is the secondary. They're long, they're athletic, they're rangy. I was impressed with them last year. I was impressed with them in spring ball. So, I feel like that's a strength, and hopefully, the defensive um, line steps up as well. Daryl, you've been a broadcaster for Gopher Games since '97. There's a whole generation of fans that remember you more as a guy behind the mic as opposed to being a great running back. You're like John Madden. All you need to do now is come up with a video game. Oh, uh, I could use a video game. That might, uh, that might help the bottom line a little bit. But, yeah, it has been, <laughs> it's been fun to, to watch. It's, been, it's fun to watch my um, – I bumped into Ron Mertz, who was a teammate of mine. I bumped into his son at the Big Ten press conference last week, and we FaceTimed his dad. Just, just like, I, I love keeping up with um, guys when um, either I played with or against their dad. I see him on teams, on other teams, on our team a lot of times. It's, um, you know, the Rushmeyer young man. I played with his dad. His dad was a great player, super-duper strong, great person. So it is, um, it's fun when you're able to, um, you know, work and enjoy the job. And this will be my, um, my 25th year, so I, I can't believe it either. 25 years behind the mic. Well, we won't hold you up any longer behind the mic today. Appreciate you spending some time. You know we'll be tapping into you as this gopher season crawls along. Looking forward to it. Thank you. I look forward to it. You guys have a great day. All right. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Daryl. He is Daryl Thompson, currently the leading rusher of all time for the University of Minnesota. Mo Ibrahim may pass him someday. More here on 10,000 Takes after this timeout. 
Imagine a public golf course where beginners feel comfortable in learning and where experienced players can test their skills. Well, you don't have to imagine it. You can live it at the Royal Golf Club at Lake Elmo, an 18-hole championship caliber course designed by golfing legends Arnold Palmer and Annika Sorenstam. With five tee boxes, bent grass fairways, and generous landing areas, the Royal Golf Club is perfect for golfers of all experience levels. Golfing and Arnie's Restaurant are open to the public, so make your tee times today at royalclubmn.com. The Royal Golf Club, a one-of-a-kind golfing experience. I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're perfect. <laughs> Maya? Oh, I love your earring. Why didn't you try these? It isn't just about vision. It's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. Now your favorite time of year is just about here. Uh, <laughs> kickoff to the NFL's preseason. Of course, actually it happened last week, but your Vikings NFL preseason kicks off this weekend. The Hall of Fame game already in the books. I know you were glued to your oh, set yeah. for that yeah. last week. But the Vikings will be in Vegas. They'll be in Las Vegas to take on the Raiders yeah. on Sunday. Vegas is already 1-0. They won that Hall of Fame game exactly. the Raiders against Jacksonville. Yeah, counterfeit football is back. <laughs> Uh, the Jags and Raiders will play four games, everybody else three, so at least it's not as much as we used to have to suffer through. Uh, I've always said these exhibition games only really mean something to the players trying to make their roster. Yeah. For those guys, these are Super Bowls. I right. get it. You're trying to put stuff on tape to prove to the Minnesota Vikings or the Las Vegas Raiders or whoever that you belong. And if even if you're cut, then maybe somebody else sees what you did and they like right. it and they pick you up. But for fans, uh, one of the great farces and shams in oh, sports is if you're a season ticket holder in the NFL, yeah. you have to buy the preseason package. So you want cheap tickets? Oh, this is your time. This is your chance because <laughs> these season ticket holders don't want any part of the scam. They put them on the secondary market, and they're very cheap. Yeah, they are. If you want to go to Lambeau, for example, and you never get a chance to go there, we did last year. If you want to go to U.S. Bank Stadium and ordinarily you can't afford it or you don't have time or whatever the case may be, it's affordable to go to U.S. Bank Statement. Basically, they're giving them away. They are. Uh, here's a tip for, I know we're going to have some Minnesota fans on the West Coast this week watching Dodgers Twins and then Angels Twins. Skip the Twins Angels game on Saturday night. Oh go boy. watch the Chargers and the Rams, the Super Bowl champs, it's for so $14 fight. at SoFi. <laughs> and you can go back bucks. to Anaheim on Sunday. There you go. <laughs> um, all right. Vikings open up on Sunday. Is there anything at all I should be looking for when I'm watching this game? I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not even sure I'm going to watch it. I, I think for me, I want to see Kellen Mond. I hope he gets a lot of snaps. Because he, they invested heavily in him, third-round pick a year right. ago in the Rick Spielman, Mike Zimmer era. We didn't see a lot of him last season. No, Zim didn't like <laughs> no. the idea. So I believe Kellen Mond, if he doesn't earn the backup spot, then there's issues with his future in Minnesota. Because if you can't beat out Sean Mannion, you have problems, right? Yeah, yeah we saw with Sean Mannion. Yes. He does not bring so much to the table. If Mond can start proving that he's got the kind of ability that Obviously, Rick Spielman thinks he has. Now you have Kevin O'Connell in this offensive-friendly system. I want to see what he does. All right, and the other guy I want to see, what's going to happen at the tight end position? Irv Smith yeah. is out for the preseason. We know that. So there's two, three guys that are going to be battling to get some playing time, and perhaps, who knows? I mean, we saw last year Tyler Conklin turned into – Irv Smith, basically. I mean, he was, you know, he had a really nice season. I think, was he in New York now? Yeah, he parlayed that into a free agent gig uh, signing with the New York Jets. Yeah, so, you know, that said, I'd like to see what's going to happen at that tight end position. And how much is Kevin O'Connell's offense going to use the tight end? You know, is that an important part of their offense going forward? And then, of course... You know, we'll see one or two series maybe with Kirk Cousins at quarterback <laughs> to start. If we're lucky. If we're lucky, yeah. And, you know, I, I we know what Kirk Cousins can do. I'm just kind of interested to see how this the new scheme is going to work with the with Cousins and 
Dalvin Cook, who we won't see any well, of. Well, and sure. that's the other thing about this game. Uh, you, you know, the Raiders have Josh McDaniels now as their head coach, who was with New England. So they've got a whole new system. Kevin O'Connell is in here with Minnesota. So, yeah, it is preseason. It is counterfeit football, as I say. But for these young coaches, they're also trying to get yeah, a feel point. and a rhythm. Now, McDaniels has been a head coach before with Denver, and that didn't go too well. But for O'Connell, this is his first shot. This is his very first game. He wants to uh, you know, put something good on tape. All right, um, let's talk the other football right now, soccer. The MLS All-Star game is in St. Paul Wednesday night. It's the MLS All-Star team playing a team from Mexico. Uh, I like the format of this, should be a great draw. Yeah, I think what makes this All-Star game different than others, you know, say in the NFL or NHL, NBA, MLB, is, is this is personal. This is a border battle, Mexican team against a U.S. team. So I think you're going to see, uh, you know, real action, real competition out there. And for the U.S., if you can beat, I think it's Liga, is yep. the name of this team, coming up to Allianz Field, that would be a, you know, a, a coup in some ways. And plus... Allianz is, is a soccer cathedral. It's getting rave reviews as being a great place to watch a match, and it'll get good exposure on this one. Yeah. All right, takes of the day coming up next. Stay with us. This is 10,000 Takes, your purple ticket. I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're perfect. <laughs> Why didn't you try these? It isn't just about vision. It's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. Ten K takes on television. We are about ready to wrap up another episode and Wally takes of the day. We're going to debate one singular topic. Okay. A uh, Video clip the Minnesota Vikings recently posted on Twitter a tribute to Double Nichols, number 55 Anthony Barr, who's now with the Dallas right. Cowboys. And some of our good friends to the east of us in Cheeseland aren't happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand that. So the idea was to show various shots of him during his Vikings career. And the upshot of it is Packer fans weren't happy with what they showed. <laughs> no, they weren't. The very first clip after you hear Roger Goodell announcing the Vikings' selection of Barr in the NFL draft was Barr's hit on Aaron Rodgers, which was not a penalty at the time, but it was something that knocked him out for the season a few years ago. And it, it wasn't a sack, it wasn't a scoop and score, but that led off the highlight montage, and the Green Bay people are saying it's classless, it's tasteless, but they would expect nothing less from a championship-less organization. All right. <laughs> I'm going to take umbrage with that. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, and foremost, uh, if you look at that clip, you know what, if I'm producing a clip, I would love to see Anthony Barr tackling and or going after uh, Aaron Rodgers. It sets it up perfectly. I mean, they didn't show it like four times over. They didn't show uh, Rodgers laying there in pain or anything like that. Basically, it is Anthony Barr coming in and dropping him down. Big deal. Get a life over there in Wisconsin. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's not all about beer, cheese, and the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> It's just a tackle, and it's just a, I mean, that, how long is that clip? Five seconds, maybe? I, th I think that this is way overblown, and I think Packer fans should, as I said, get a life. I, I will counter by saying this, and I was a huge Anthony Barr fan, still am. I wish him well in Dallas. But of all the great things he did going to four Pro Bowls, that's not one of them. And I don't think it was a cheap shot. I don't think it was malicious. But that, to me, doesn't make your highlight montage. Nah. And the Minnesota Vikings knew exactly what they were doing when they rubber-stamped that because that put Aaron Rodgers out for this season and allowed Minnesota to win the NFC North. They were celebrating that play, and the organization should be above that. But they're not because they don't have any rings. And wow. Green Bay's got four. Wow. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> And there you go. 
takes of the day, and we got to go. Let's FedEx out those thank yous. I want to the great crew here at MCN Channel 6, also to Daryl Thompson and Rocky. For Wally, I'm Eric. This is 10K Takes, your sports ticket.